Case number 111651, Steckline Communications, Inc. v. Journal Broadcast Group of Kansas, Inc. Thank you. Council, you may have been informed earlier that because of our audience today in the courtroom and also people <clears throat> watching this live on the internet, we would ask you to give perhaps a 60 second factual overview so we know what we're dealing with. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I, I'm not sure that in the course of my career I've been able to give a 60 second <laughs> factual <laughs> overview, but we'll endeavor simply to say that uh, for this particular class of visitors, the case we're about to argue is a civil case. It's the only one on this morning's docket which represents a dispute between individual parties, or in this case, two companies from Wichita versus a criminal case where the state's charged someone with a crime. In this case, my client produces radio programming uh, and was party to an agreement we claim that obligated Mr. Fowler's client, who owns and operates radio stations, to broadcast our pro programming. They stopped broadcasting it. My client sued them. They defended the suit. The District Court of Sedgwick County dismissed my client's claim, and we've appealed it to the appellate courts. That's close to 60 seconds, I think. That was outstanding, Counselor. It was shocking. <laughs> it's shocking. I, uh, Your Honor, uh, I would like to ask to reserve uh, three minutes uh, to respond to Appley's arguments. Um, three minutes is granted. I wouldn't presume to claim uh, that I understand why this court granted the petition for review in this case, but I have to believe that it had to do with the holding that was the linchpin of the Court of Appeals decision in this case. And it's one of those unusual situations in which that linchpin is something that really wasn't discussed at all in district court and was discussed only in passing in a few lines of the Appley's brief in the Court of Appeals. But the essence of that holding, so that we can identify what we're talking about, is the Court of Appeals ruling, which held that in a contract case in which the contract is written and in which the terms of the contract provide, as many written contracts do, that it can only be modified or amended in writing, and when the contract provides that no future course of conduct can be interpreted so as to amend or modify the contract, when those conditions and circumstances are present, no contractual right can be waived, no estoppel defense is available other than by way of an express waiver in writing, period, ever. And the essential part of that that really wasn't discussed at any great length below was the contribution of what is in paragraph 16 of the agreement and issue, which is the no waiver by course of conduct provision. I want to hasten to add, I don't. Is that what that provision really is? I mean, you just described it as a no waiver. Is that the same as I read the actual <clears throat> paragraph in issue it's it, it talks about amendment correct and a waiver of course is an amendment of a contract isn't it well that, i guess that's my question for you is that your, that's your position that there's no it certainly is to? Uh, it's the you know relinquishment of a contractual right which amends the contract uh, at least that's our position your honor um we're certainly not contending that the Court of Appeals wasn't at liberty to read a written instrument and say what it chose to say about it. Uh, it always has that right. 
it is an unusual situation in which it wasn't really discussed below, and because of that, the only real argument that we presented in writing regarding this issue was in our petition for review, and frankly, that was probably because we weren't smart enough to grasp that an appellate court might take a look at that part of the agreement versus the one that the district court and the appellee and the appellant talked about in district court and in their papers in the Court of Appeals. So the point is, A, our petition for review is really the only place where this issue is discussed, and as is noted in our petition, we respectfully submit that the Court of Appeals got it wrong, at least in terms of how this particular panel said what it said. Can I just stop you there and wind back a second to just clarify your argument? When you say that this issue was only discussed in the petition for review, are you referring to the waiver argument? I'm referring to the component of the ruling that says when those three conditions are present, there's never a waiver. Okay. And to answer your question, Your Honor, specifically the language in paragraph 16. Right. As I understood, however, the factual allegations that you made in district court, it did include an allegation of estoppel. Yes, at pages three and four of the pretrial conference order. So again, so that was raised in district court. It's just my, I'm just seeking clarification. Waiver and estoppel, yes. Did you raise waiver or just estoppel? And is there a difference between the two? On the facts of this case, though, there's a difference between the two if you read enough case law. In candor, Your Honor, I can't recall the exact language we used at pages three and four of the pretrial conference order. We certainly argued that the facts established a waiver. We're here on a district court's ruling on a motion to dismiss. So, correct? That's correct. And so, I mean, and that's advantageous to you and your position in the, to the extent that we have to consider the facts that you allege to be true. It just sounded to me like you were, that you actually did raise this in district court. We did. Okay. I may have misunderstood your earlier discussion of how it came up for the first time. What I meant to say is, I felt that, I don't want to sound like every appellant that ever walks in here, there's always going to be something in an adverse appellate opinion where history is written by the victors. And so you read the adverse opinion, well, that's not quite right or et cetera, et cetera. And I mentioned this because I am a little sensitive to the fact that the court of appeals decision almost made it sound as if we denied the essential predicate of the appellee's argument. We have never contended that the entity Mid-America Ag Network Inc. sought or obtained consent to assign the contract in issue to my client's Decline Communications Inc. We've never contended that. We've always acknowledged that. So if I'm a little sensitive on, I just wanted to make it clear to the larger group, that's not an argument we're making. We do claim that after broadcasting our programming for seven years without major incident until the events in June of 2012, I've lost the exact date, this was not a problem and that our involvement in furnishing the program was known to Journal Broadcast Group Inc. The sale of the Steckline business essentially from father to son was well publicized in Wichita, which is frankly a smallish media market. Correspondence between the parties from our side was from Steckline Communications Inc. intended to address problems with the programming. And last but not least, when we filed our lawsuit in this case, the defendant appellee journal, instead of filing a motion to dismiss our petition or filing a third party petition to bring in Mid-America Ag Network Inc., which it well knew was a separate and distinct corporation, filed a counterclaim against Steckline Communications Inc. based on the contract. So 
Yes, we do contend that they waived their right to uh, enforce the no assignment without permission provision or, or a stop from raising it. Uh, and it seems to me, counsel, but feel free to disagree with me if you do, that the heart of this case is the Court of Appeals ruling that it is not, I'm reading from their, at the, the last paragraph of their opinion, it's not possible for journaled for the defendant to, to waive the assignment provisions of the settlement agreement through its conduct. Isn't that the, the heart of the disagreement? If that's true as a statement of law, don't, it, don't you lose? Yes. Okay. Happily, so, it's not true as a statement right, of law. Right. So that's my follow-up question. What's, what's your best argument for why the Court of Appeals was wrong? Because that's never been the law, because it accords to a written agreement, a status that would place it above an oral agreement, which is inconsistent with the law it's, as it's existed in all 50 states, including this one since statehood. Oral agreements, written agreements, stand on an equal footing, and as I believe it was Corbin, uh, or whoever writes Corbin now, said in the quote in our papers, Two contracting parties cannot, by mutual agreement, limit their power to control their legal relations in the future by mutual agreement, nor can they in this manner prescribe new rules of evidence and procedure in the proof of facts. I submit that it's part and parcel of our distaste for efforts to control the future, as in the case of restraints on trade, restraints on alienation, any hands from the grave in estate and probate matters. Now, I well understand, as I think I indicated in our petition, the problems faced by commercial creditors who may accept the stray late payment. If I had your job, I would certainly appreciate or a district court's job more particularly, uh, appreciate black and white rules, yes, no, <coughs> never, words like that. And from your point of view, I'm mindful of the problems of floodgates and that. Uh, we have said in the past, haven't we, that these uh, no amendment but by writing, but in writing clauses are enforceable, right? And, and I guess the follow-up question, if, if that's true, if we've said in, in the past that no amendment except through writing is enforceable, how does that square with your position here? Well, it places whatever case you're referring to uh, in a location inconsistent with the decision you made in 1870 um, in the case cited in my papers and that's been reiterated by the Court of Appeals as recent as 10 years ago that you can waive a contract. Well, and that drives back to my, my earlier course question. Of conduct. Is, is waiver really an amendment to the contract? Well, or, is the, it, or is it a, an equitable doctrine that prevents is, a party from asserting a right? You're right, Your Honor. It is an equitable doctrine of judicial repose that has the effect of amending the contract. Okay. <clears throat> That's our position in any event. Um, now, you, Counselor, you concede that uh, your client's Asinor, who was actually the contracting party here, correct? Correct. Did not seek written consent to assign. Yes. Yes. Now, from your standpoint, it seems to me that the Asinor intending to hold a third party um, uh, to be bound by an assignment has to notify that other person of the assignment. <coughs> Would you agree with that? I think we have case law that says until uh, uh, the, the third party is, is notified of the assignment, they're not bound by it. I'm, I'm not aware of that specific case law and likewise uh, I do believe that notice can certainly be implied and inferred from seven years of course of conduct. 
which is what we're dealing with in this case. Um, this was an agreement that Journal didn't like, and when the unfortunate broadcast on the date and issue of two sources of programming at the same time surfaced, uh, Journal uh, seized on that opportunity to declare a breach of contract, which, if the court is correct, it could have declared seven years earlier. Now, our problem, our issue to talk like a lawyer, uh, is not only substantive, but it was how this matter was teed up in the district court. Uh, I won't go back through that in detail, because frankly, it would exceed my time, but I would like to conclude by reading to the court the oral statement upon which the judgment against my client in district court, as affirmed in the Court of Appeals, was based. Quote, third, the motion to dismiss for lack of standing under the contract technically is sustained on the counterclaim, but I'm denying it as far as there was an agreement, a working agreement between the defendant and somebody, and they were dealing with the plaintiff's employees and or agents. I'm, pardon the expression, bastardizing the situation here to a certain extent in that maybe stretching might be a better word, that there is a contract and the right people are in the courtroom that acted as one and it's going to be up to a jury to determine the exact terms and if there is a breach between these two parties. Based on that, the 12B6 motion was filed more than a year after the pleadings were closed and judgment against us was granted ostensibly on the standing issue. I think the appellee acknowledges in its paper, I mean, what's in the name, but I think it would be more properly standing or not the real party in interest. We contend that was an error. It was error in the district court. It was error of the Court of Appeals to affirm it. And we asked this court to reverse the judgment below and remand this case for a trial to let our client present its evidence that this defendant waived its right over seven years to assist on literal enforcement of paragraph 14 of the agreement. Are there any other questions? Is, is it your position that you fall within the provision of that assignment um, paragraph that would allow an assignment in this situation? There are two different situations described in the paragraph and it's a little confusing. I appreciate the question. In 2005, when the assignment took place, Steckline Communications Inc. was not, repeat, was not a competitor of Journal Broadcast Inc. in the Wichita radio market, placing it in that part of the paragraph that said either party needed consent to assign, but consent would not be unreasonably withheld. And there's nothing in that language that voids an assignment if it's not. So it, is it your position that that second portion is really just a notice provision? I'm sorry, Your Honor, the, is, is the, 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 the it, part that you say applies to you says that it, it, it shall, that the assignment shall be allowed, basically, um, except in, in exceptional circumstances. So is that really just a notice provision? Well, I have to acknowledge to Your Honor that if the word reasonable appears in almost any setting, it implies some sort of factual question. But query, under what circumstances would it be unreasonable? Any further questions? Yes. On, on the record before the district court, uh, who is uh, Steckline and who is uh, Mid-America? And I ask that in this context. In some of the briefing, there's an argument that there's an asset purchase. Uh, you've mentioned during your oral argument there was an assignment um, how did Steckline acquire Mid-America, and does that make any difference? There, there's, two, there's two groups of words that sound a lot alike. 
there's an entity called Mid-America Ag Network, Inc. It's a Kansas corporation. It's since changed its name. It was owned by a guy named Larry Steckline. It produced radio programming of interest to farmers and ranchers. That programming was branded. It was branded in the same manner that TV that goes out as CBS News goes out as CBS News and not as Columbia Broadcasting Systems, Inc., LLC News, or that Kimberly Clark sells tissue paper as Kleenex. Mid-America Ag Network was a brand name. In 2005, Mid-America Ag Network, Inc., sold various assets to the plaintiff's predecessor. There was an inter intervening entity also owned by the principal of my client, including the business contracts of Mid-America Ag Network, Inc., which included the settlement agreement. So that the assignment took place in the context of that asset sale. It was the assignment of a contract right. Does that address? Yeah. There's, there is a problem in this case, whether it's intentional or not. There's no question that it's confusing to re reference man and man ink. Uh, we regret it. We deal with the facts we have to deal with. But I understand some confusion uh, emanating from that. But it was not a stock sale. It was an asset sale. And one of the assets sold was this contract. One of the issues I struggle with as I review the material is that it seems like there are a lot of factual disputes that haven't been resolved, haven't been argued, per, or even presented. Uh, that was certainly our position in the district court. Um, the issue that the judge, and, and I, and I want to add that this is the late Richard Ballinger, who's a friend of mine, and he died not long after he decided this case. Uh, it is frankly sickening to me to be up here arguing about a decision that I respectfully submit he butchered. I knew him well enough where I could have said that in front of him or I wouldn't say it to you. But you're exactly right. There was no Apple motion pending and we walk away with a finding on a disputed issue of fact which is then levered into judgment as a matter of law on a 12B6 motion a year after the pleadings are closed. That's our beef. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. May it please the court, Jay Fowler on behalf of the Journal of Broadcasting of Kansas. Let me raise the point, or address the point uh, you just raised. Uh, this case was decided at the district court on the basis of clear contract language. The district court enforced clear and unambiguous contract language. Now, was there a dispute? Well, we had a summary judgment hearing, and Mr. Trepar told Judge Ballinger what he admitted today. At page 25 of the hearing on January 30th, I am absolutely acknowledging, Your Honor, it's the first thing I said, Mid-America Ag Work Network Inc. did not contact Journal and say we're selling some of our assets to Steckline Communications Inc. pursuant to paragraph 14. We hereby request your consent uh, to our assignment of the agreement to Steckline Communications Inc. I am agreeing and acknowledging that a request for consent did not formally get extended to the defendant, nor did they wake up one night and say we consent without being asked. There was no consent. So there's no contract? So there's no contract between your client and Steckline? No contract. Steckline becomes a stranger to the contract. But I understood your client counterclaimed on the contract. We counterclaimed because if you will recall on our answer, 
We've asserted our answer. We don't know who you are. We don't think you are entitled to bring this claim. But they sued on the contract. And under the contract, we had a right to claim attorney's fees. So we file a counterclaim as essentially an alternative pleading, which we then drop when the court finds that our position is correct, that Steckline Inc. had no ability to bring this claim. So your client actually, for seven years or however long uh, your client was doing business with Steckline, were actually in, in breach of the contract? We were we were provi we were allowing a, 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 a audio feed to our station from a person who was not authorized to send it to us, and we did so because we did not understand that there was an assignment of the contract, because it all comes to us as Mid America Ag Network well, program. Wouldn't that be a factual uh, dispute? I, I hear both sides of the argument from that podium, why is that ripe for a, a, a motion to dismiss if there's a, a factual dispute about your client's notice of who it was doing business with for seven years? Because there is no factual dispute about compliance with the terms of the contract. And this is the important thing from the standpoint of the administration of commercial relationships in, in contracts. This contract arose out of a settlement of a lawsuit in 2003. It was written by sophisticated lawyers in sophisticated relationships involving sophisticated clients. And they wanted to control how this relationship worked. And so they included paragraph 14 and paragraph 16 of the agreement, among multiple other paragraphs. And it said, we're going to let you provide us programming, and we're going to accept that programming, but there are certain terms and conditions that come with that. One of it is you can't willy-nilly assign it. You're going to have to come to us and get written consent if you want to assign it. And in some situations, we can turn that assignment down without any reason. But you've got to do that. Okay. Could you have accepted the uh, assignment? I mean, could you uh, have, uh, without the uh, written consent, could you have knowingly continued for seven years to do business with Steckline under the contract? Well, if, if you had, if your client had known about the assignment and continued to, to work for seven years, what would uh, have been the effect of that? Well, if our client had known of the assignment, and bear, bear in mind, the notice provision is a very specific notice provision. It is not a low-level notice provision. It requires you to contact one of two people in Milwaukee. If well, that's, I, I know what the contract says. Yeah. My question is, if your client had known that Steckline was the assignee during some significant portion of the seven years that you were doing business with Stackline, uh, uh, I presume, under the terms of the contract, then what would have been the legal effect of that? Well, I think it'd still be a breach. By you, right? Well, no, if by you, If you were accepting if, uh, if the benefits of the contract and engaging in, I'm going to take away the significant period of time, if even one transaction occurred, between the parties and with knowledge, knowledge of your client of the assignment, would that be a breach by your client? You could call it a breach. Maybe you could call it a waiver because you'd have a knowing and intentional relinquishment of a right, which is what a waiver is. And, and which isn't is, there a disputed issue of fact as we sit here today on whether there was that knowledge? Well, Not talking about the particular wording of the contract on how the notice was to be provided, but actual knowledge? Well, first of all, waiver was not a defense that was, uh, or a claim that was made in the pretrial order. Only estoppel was. And, and, and Justice Stiegel asked a question early on about what's the, the difference. difference. Mm -hmm. 
Well, waiver is a, a knowing and intentional a relinquishment of a right, and estoppel is doing something that causes a reliance. Uh, it's a it's a reliance kind of equitable concept. Taking taking care of grandpa. Right. So so those are two different concepts in this case, mm -hmm. and the contract prohibits the waiver. And what we have here is two businesses trying to structure their relationship in an economic way. But we're not talking about upfront uh, uh, formation. We're talking about course of conduct. And why isn't accepting the benefits under a contract that uh, uh, you knowing that you know violates a provision of that contract work in estoppel to assert that uh, uh, provision to your advantage after you've taken the benefit of the rest of the contract. Well, let's. Uh, I mean, you can call it waiver estoppel, but I, I see it. You're stopped from asserting that paragraph if you've knowingly violated that paragraph for seven years. Well, I guess a, a little more background is needed because the question is what benefit did Journal accept? They received no payments under this contract. Uh, they got no uh, ad revenues off the time that was sold. What, what was given to uh, Mid-America Ag Network was essentially two hours and I think six minutes. Aren't those, aren't those all fact contract? questions, though? Not if you go uh, back to the contract. Well, but isn't the question, I mean, it seems to me that your argument and, and the ruling of the Court of Appeals was that because of the language of the contract, the judicial doctrine of equitable estoppel simply cannot apply in, to this contract as a matter of law, because we're on a motion to dismiss here. So it seems to me you have to win as a matter of law. Well, we're Once not... we get into the factual questions, it's, it's not amenable to a motion to dismiss. Well, it, it comes up because the court made a decision, the district court made a decision based on the statement from Mr. Tretmar that I read that there was no compliance with the request for consent uh, and there was no written consent uh, for, the, for the assignment that they claim was made. And with, with in, in that context, you have a motion to dismiss, but you have a motion to dismiss decided on a legal issue that the court has addressed and resolved and which is now admitted in the record in front of the district court. Well, you're, 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 Steckline says the legal issue is whether or not they can claim estoppel, not whether or not they complied with the notice provision of the assignment. And I don't think they can claim estoppel because... Why not? That's the, that's the, the heart of this case, right? Why is, can't they? Because in this context, very specific rules were put in the contract. A condition preceding it. Your be. argument is that parties can contractually eliminate the forever eliminate the possibility of estoppel being raised. In this case, so, under this set of facts, and, yes. And, uh, it, it, do you have case law that supports that? Well, the, As I read the case law, that uh, that isn't how I read the uh, majority of the authorities. The Fakes case, which is cited by the Court of Appeals, exactly says that. It's a Kansas Supreme Court case. And when you read the cases uh, that restrict these assignment provisions and talk about subsequent courts of conduct and the acceptance of the late payment, what you will see are a couple important things. You'll see a lot of them relate to the uh, alienation of title, the transfer of land. And there's a public policy out there. Uh, Mr. Tretbar made a reference to it, reaching out from the grave and trying to control land titles and such. Those kinds of cases, the assignment provisions are very narrowly construed. There are cases where you're talking about simply the assignment of a right of payment. And in those cases, the, the courts, that when they've addressed that issue, have said, you know, I can see a waiver argument easily made or an estoppel argument because all you're doing is saying move payments from one place to another place. But let's look at this contract. This is an executory contract where obligations are assigned to Mid-America Ag Network to perform. All Journal has to do is play the programming as it comes in. 
Mid-America Ag Network is providing the content. That content is exceedingly important. It, it poses potential liabilities on journal. Right, right know, but it's the benefit you're receiving under the contract. I think a minute ago you said we're, we weren't getting anything under the well, contract. Well, except, we were. but no, all we have done is given them two hours and six minutes of time under our agreement. We no longer, we're not receiving any compensation for that. You they mean, have the benefit. It's a detriment to us, actually. That's, I mean, that's the problem. The problem is, is we have sold our two, minute, two hours and, and, and six minutes to, to Mid-America Ag Network by the settlement agreement, and we've said, you have to do these things to qualify for it, and they didn't do it. That's so that's it. your dispute with Mid-America Ag Network. Um, and I understand that. It seems to me that most of your arguments go between the privity <laughs> that was established there. But aren't we talking about a different situation? That's because now, arguably, there's a fact question of whether or not Journal had notice um, that they were in a relationship with the third party. And by course of conduct, a contract was affected with the third party. Aren't, aren't there questions of fact surrounding that relationship as opposed to whatever the connection might have been bet between the original contractors? Well, what are the terms of this new contract? Isn't that the fact question? No, because the, the contract right that even allows Mid-America Ag Network access to the station is, is this document which has, has very specific terms on it. But isn't the question that whether through a course of conduct and by estoppel, you essentially as assented to the uh, terms and conditions being the same as that written contract had been? Well, I don't think so. And, and, and really, but why? It, I well, mean, all right, get back, let's get back to the, the corporate structures involved in the nature of these complex business relationships. We have a local station in Wichita, Kansas. We have the corporate entity actually in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. What the corporate entity in Milwaukee, Wisconsin wanted to do is to make sure they understood and controlled how this contract was going to be interpreted and who had what rights to it. And the failure to do that was a breach of contract by Journal against Mid-America Ad Network. No, not at all. Because what they did is they said, here's the rules for how Mid-America Ag Network is going to, to get access to the program. And Mid-America Ag Network violated the terms of that contract by assigning it without consent. Right, and so... So why isn't that a breach of contract against Mid-America Ag Network? Well, but the point of it is, if Mid-America Ag Network violated it, how in the world does Steckline get permission to, to use the benefit of the contract? Isn't that a breach by itself? Is it, does a material breach excuse It's not a breach if, you, if your client had knowledge of it and essentially acceded to it and said, you know what, that was a foul, but it was a no harm, so we're just going to, we kind of like the arrangement, we're going to go forward. Well, the question I think, and I've I, I made, made this point before, but isn't the question is, are not businesses in a commercial relationship involving contracts of this nature, an executory contract that, that has ongoing obligations by the other side, aren't they allowed to define how that ability to get access to that collection of rights are transferred? Uh, and if you, if you adopt a rule that says you can always have, under any circumstance, a waiver of that, then when the business lawyer writes the contract and says no, further, no course of contact will be deemed a waiver, the only way this contract can be modified or assigned is, is this kind of step, you're rendering those kinds of provisions meaningless. And that brings uncertainty to the commercial relationship in, uh, relationships in law. And that's the heart of this problem. I, I want to go back from a little different angle. Uh, Justice Lukert was uh, trying to, the point she was trying to make <coughs> with you is that your client's contract was with man, not Steckline. Would you agree to that? Absolutely. And you made the argument that you were entitled to uh, dismissal uh, based on the statement from Steckline's counsel that Steckline never obtained written consent. Why did Steckline have an obligation 
to perform under that paragraph of the contract when Steckline was not a party of that co contract. Steckline is attempting to take the benefits. No, but Steckline is not a party to that contract. Is that correct? You're, you're making that argument. They're not. So why are they bound by the provisions of that contract? Well, the claim was brought under the contract. If they are not entitled to assert the rights under the contract, they lose. That's the nub of the case. Maybe and maybe not. <laughs> I think one of the things that your um, opposing counsel was arguing was that to affirm the Court of Appeals decision would elevate written contract over oral contract. Are they, I, I, I understand this may not be the way the pleadings have been drawn, but is, was that an argument as you understood it? I was having a little trouble understanding it. I'll give them an opportunity to help me out on rebuttal. But my understanding of that was that in essence a new deal was made. Well. A new oral deal between your client and his client, not between the original parties of the contract. Judge Ballinger gave uh, Steckline an opportunity to try to amend the pleadings to assert a claim like that, and they failed to do so. Okay. When they failed to do so, we filed the motion to dismiss. The, the only claims that were pending, as I understand the record and your argument, from by made by the plaintiff were claims arising under the written contract. Absolutely. So in order to have standing, as you just said, they have to be able to show some right arising out of the written contract. Yes. That's our position. Did Journal claim a breach of paragraph four uh, regarding the uh, offensive content and violation of the FCC rules? We did. And did you ask that whoever you were dealing with cure? We did not in the context of the foul language breach, which was the grammar lesson that's referred to in the, in the record. There was a history of multiple other failures uh, that is documented in the record where we gave them opportunities to fix. <coughs> Who were you dealing with then? Well, we believe we were dealing with Mid-America Ag Network. If and I understand the record then, there were some uh, difficulties with delivery of the content, technical problems, and the parties had worked to cure those, and then the offensive uh, broadcast caused uh, the effort to terminate under the uh, paragraph four of this agreement. Right. That's, okay. That was the ultimate straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. And then you were surprised when Steckline showed up trying to sue. Right. We weren't surprised when Greg Steckline showed up because Greg Steckline was involved in the business in 2000. Well, when Mid America Ag Network uh, and in 2002 and 2003 when the settlement was made, Greg Steckline was a principal in that organization. What we were surprised was Steckline Communications Inc. shows up as the plaintiff. And it even gets a layer of complexity there because we then learn in the discovery process that Mid-America had this general assignment to Steckline Communications LLC uh, uh, it, 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 as part of, a, it doesn't specifically reference the contract, it says business contracts or relationships are assigned. And then somehow Steckline Communications Inc. shows up as the plaintiff. So we, we, we actually have two assignments apparently, uh, none of which Journal was advised of and none of which Journal gave its consent to. Do you have any further questions? Council, do you need 30 seconds to wrap up? I think you've made your points. All right, I've made my points, thank you. Well, thank you, Council. You reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Oh, I'll try to ask you from the... We need to uh, have you in front of the camera, Council. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, in respect to Justice Byer's question, um, we do contend that there was a new agreement. It was an implied agreement based on their acceptance of our content for seven years. That's what I thought you meant. Um, and so what's your response to your opposing counsel's point that you were given an opportunity to amend to add that kind of a claim? I would ask the court to examine the opportunity to which counsel refers. The hearing on our 
motion for summary judgment was approximately 10 days before this matter was scheduled to commence a jury trial. We had the hearing to which, from which I quoted briefly earlier. Um, it was a strange hearing. Uh, there's any number of things that we could have filed, but we certainly did not feel that he, what had happened is the court had denied our motion, leaving our case on track to go to jury trial. There was no motion filed by the sophisticated lawyers on the other side, not a 12B6 motion to dismiss when we filed the case, not a 12C motion for judgment on the pleadings at any point before the pretrial conference order, and certainly not a motion for summary judgment that teed up the factual issue which was controverted, which Judge Ballinger presumably was trying to adjudicate in the passage I read from. So with apologies, we don't feel that we were given an adequate opportunity to amend, um, and we thought we were on for trial. Instead, we got a 12B6 motion to dismiss. Maybe. Uh, days before the trial, we should have filed a motion to amend your honor, and, and uh, if that's dispositive on these facts, then I regret it. Very briefly, the benefit that Journal got uh, from this contract, as your honor put your finger right on it, was two hours of radio programming that it did not have to produce or pay for, that it could broadcast six days out of seven every week for 15 years for zero. Uh, the term of the agreement that changed, I've forgotten which justice posed the question, was pretty simple. It's simply that Steckline Communications Inc. could furnish the programming versus Mid-America Ag Network Inc. Um, and in response to uh, Able Counsel's comment that yes, it's a commercial world, we like certainty in commercial contracts, I devote a fair amount of my practice to this kind of work, I couldn't agree with him more. But the parties, just as they can define their relationship, they can adjust their relationship. We contend that that's what occurred here. We contend that we should be given an opportunity to prove that that's what occurred here. I could continue, but there's other cases on the docket unless there's questions. Counsel, what lesson should be gleaned from this for other sophisticated lawyers who deal with sophisticated business clients on sophisticated business transactions sure. when they when they come to draft a contract between their clients? I, uh, in, in candor, Your Honor, uh, I'm supposed to be an advocate, but I make no points by telling stretchers. Uh, 2020 hindsight, Mid-America Ag Network Inc. should have sought the consent of Journal for the assignment of the settlement agreement, and it didn't do it. That's the difference. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with the contract provision. Now, as I mentioned to Justice, the request would have been made in 05 when there would have been no good reason to deny it. But had that been done, we wouldn't be here, I don't think. We might be based on the, I was mentioning the counsel who I've known for a long time. The interesting part of this case is how the bad words got on the radio the frustration of the legal process is we haven't been able to argue about whose fault it was. It's been all this procedural and contractual business. Thank you, counsel. Do we have any further questions? Seeing none, we thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement. We now turn to the second case on this morning's docket. That is case number 111556, State of Kansas v. Jose Solis. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court, Carol Longenecker Schmidt of the Appellate Defender Office representing Jose Solis. Uh, Chief Justice, I would like three minutes for rebuttal. Three minutes is granted. Thank you. Um, just to offer the brief 60 
second um, factual summary, and I'll face the microphone instead of the students because I don't have a particularly loud voice. Um, but Mr. Solis was convicted of a jury trial, or convicted of first degree murder, premeditated murder, after a jury trial. Um, he was convicted for killing his um, former girlfriend, Natasha Crump, um, on December 22, 23, 2006. Um, Police found Ms. Crump's body in Mr. Solis's apartment. Um, she was in a bedroom and she had been strangled and had scratch marks on her body. Uh, Mr. Solis claimed that um, on the evening of December 22, 2006, he was at work and he came home. He went to a friend's apartment to um, drink and then he went on a side trip to a nearby town and then he came back. And Ms. Crump was at her, his apartment. Um, they got into an argument. Um, and he admits that the argument got physical, after which he said that they had sex, and then um, he went to sleep on the couch in the apartment, and that's the last time that he saw Ms. Crump alive. Um, there were the issues in this case. Um, there are three instructional issues and two, or one evidentiary issue that really encompasses kind of two different types of, or two different um, pieces of evidence that were admitted in error. And unless your honors prefer it otherwise this morning, I'd like to start with the third issue in the brief. That is the issue about um, the giving of lesser included instructions. This issue is really about the application of the 2011 amendment to the culpable mental state statute to the giving of lesser included offense instructions. A district court judge must instruct on lesser included offense offenses when there is some evidence that would allow a jury to reasonably convict of those lesser included offense instructions. In 2011, the legislature amended the culpable mental state statute to state that proof of a higher degree of culpability than the crime charge constitutes proof of the culpability charge. If recklessness suffices to establish an element then so does intentional conduct. So with this amendment, um, the inference is that when there is evidence at trial that a defendant acted intentionally, therefore there is always evidence that the defendant also acted recklessly. Um, and the logical conclusion here is that um, if a defendant is charged with intentional murder, he or she would always be given the reckless forms of um, homicide, so reckless, unintentional second-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter. And that that uh, statute that makes uh, proof of intentional also proof of reckless was not in effect in 2006 when the crime occurred. Yes, that's what the, the state is arguing. And wasn't that part of the entire rewrite uh, of the uh, criminal code? Yes, so the subsection C of um, 2152.02 was added in during the recodification. And that recodification was accompanied by, and I, I can't remember the, uh, the statute number, but uh, that says this new code will apply to crimes that occur after its adoption. And in making that determination, if any substantial element of the crime has been committed before the effective date of the code, then it's under the old code. In other words, there was a statute that accompanied the adoption of the new code that basically made the new code only <coughs> effective uh, after its adoption. I am not familiar with that. Um... My argument in the reply brief was that this is merely a procedural change to the law. But we um, don't have to go there if we have an express uh, statement by the legislature. I think that that's the correct analysis. That um, yeah. yes, like if the if the legislature says prospectively, says yeah. then you don't have to go there. Another way to view this would be that Mr. Solis's case is um, it's not final; it's still pending. Um, you know, maybe talking about retroactive application isn't even the, quite the correct phrase here. Um, yeah, because this case is not final um, and the statute came out while his case was pending. Um, so I think that 
Yeah, that's the argument that we would rely on at this point. Um, the state in its brief talks about the statute not applying. Counselor, just it's uh, 215103D, if you may want to look at that, is the statute that I'm telling you that uh, made the code uh, uh, not applicable to crimes committed prior to July 1, <coughs> 2011. That seems like a pretty big hurdle for you to, to clear on this. I, yes, Your Honor, that could be a burden. I have not read it, so I can't comment. I could sit down and try to comment further on rebuttal for you. Um, yeah, so but, I don't. But, think but I your more. position is, if, if it does apply, or somehow you can get to it, uh, get that it does, is that in this type of situation, or, or in any homicide case, second degree reckless would always be given as an instruction, or what? What are you? Yes. If there's, if there's proof of intentional conduct, then that necessarily um, requires instructing on let reckless. So, yes. so basically now in any homicide case, a, a judge is required to give <laughs> basically every lesser, maybe not voluntary because that, right. that's a different, but at least in terms of in your position would be that uh, premeditated first degree murder, second degree murder, intentional, second degree murder, reckless, and then involuntary. Yes, that it would have to be given. Yes, that is my position. It, but that, and if this crime had taken place in 2011, that would sure. be your position. Yes, I, that's all right. I understand the argument as to why your argument as to why <clears throat> uh, all of those lessers would be legally appropriate. In other words, as I understand your argument, the elements sort of nest inside one another, and so it's always legally appropriate. Um, can you address the second prong of that, though, as to whether or not a district court has some sort of gatekeeping function to determine whether or not the lesser is actually is factually appropriate? I think that this the amendment to the statute also um, explains why it would be factually appropriate because the statute the first word is proof of a higher degree, so it's talking about evidence. Um, I think it's saying that when there are when there is evidence of intentional conduct that factually, that means there's also evidence of reckless conduct. Um, I think it's, yeah, yeah, I think it's saying that. Um, it, it, it's saying that the evidence would be sufficient to yes. support the lesser culpable state. Yes, that's my argument. But uh, tie that in for me to the statute on lesser included, which requires that the district court determine that a jury would be reasonably justified Right. And convicting on the lesser. Right. I think the jury would be so if so if the district court judge had both of these statutes in front of him or her, um, read them together, and the some evidence that the jury would rely on to reasonably convict um, would be, if there's evidence of intentional conduct, it has to be reckless because of the second statute. So that so presumably, let me take a step back. If um, if a jury had all these, all of the homicide instructions, except for perhaps involuntary or voluntary manslaughter, they would also have an instruction, the pick instruction that explains this, that explains that proof of intentional conduct results um, or proves reckless conduct, and that therefore would allow a jury to reasonably convict a person when there's only intentional conduct presented at trial of a reckless offense. Um, so I think the instruction, the pick instruction that would accompany these lesser included instructions, that brings us back to the initial statute, and that would give a jury some evidence to convict. Just to summarize, your argument is anytime there's some evidence or sufficient evidence, then a jury would be reasonably justified in convicting. Yes. Right, okay. Can I take you uh, back to the 6455 evidence? Yes. Um, this, this was the second trial. And at the first trial, there were some objections, some rulings made. Uh, the evidence that you're complaining about now was offered at the first trial? I believe it was. And that uh, trial counsel stipulated that 
that basically was going to be the parameters of the court's uh, order in limine um, at the second trial. It's my understanding that the, the uh, uh, there was no <coughs> objection beyond uh, uh, what was done at the first trial. Counsel agreed that uh, uh, the evidence that, the, that was offered at the first trial could be offered at the second trial. Oh, I'm not aware of that, Your Honor. Um, I, my recollection is that um, let's see, at the pretrial conference before the second trial, they referenced pretrial rulings and orders that um, were made before the first trial. Um, I'm not aware of a stipulation. Well, I don't think it was a stipulation. I think they agreed that the trial judge's previous rulings would govern the second trial. Is, now, are you trying to... There wasn't any objection to the second trial, right? Right. And so we have a preservation right. problem. Right. How do you get over that? Do you say that that uh, agreement that the judge's rulings at the first trial are going to govern at the second trial is tantamount to a continuing objection? Or how, how do you get over the, the problem of no objection to the second trial? Yeah, that, that was not my argument. Um, I, when they were referencing the first trial, I thought they were just talking about pre-trial rulings, not any sort of objections or stipulations that happened at trial. Um, my argument about preservation for the first issue is um, largely that this is the admission of propensity evidence is a due process violation. And I'm aware that this court um, has refused to apply the exceptions to you can't raise a rule for the, or an issue for the first time on appeal. Um, but typically this court does not apply those to evidentiary issues. Um, but my argument would be that this is um, a due process violation and that um, Mr. Solis should be able to apply this or raise this for the first time on appeal. Um, this court has in the past treated the admission or the erroneous admission of propensity evidence as a due process violation, not for preservation purposes, but um, when looking at um, whether the admission of that evidence was reversible. So applying the Chapman, Chapman harmless error standard um, so there was an assumption there made that um, propens the admission of propensity evidence is a due process violation, but I don't think a full analysis was ever And which done. specific evidence? Now, we, the, some evidence was withheld, suppressed. The <coughs> evidence of a prior conviction and, and some other evidence. Um, uh, your client conceded to uh, the evidence of what happened in December, right? Or that that was that wasn't objected to the evidence of what happened in December, the date of mm -hmm. the month of, of killing. So we're talking about some events that happened before December, but I was a little unclear specifically what evidence that you were talking about. Okay, um, I hope I can clarify. So there's two pieces of evidence, or groups of evidence. There's evidence of um, batteries, domestic batteries, that occurred before December 2006. And that evidence came in a trial through Richard Kaufman, I believe. And he testified about um, Ms. Crump coming to the restaurant, and he would see bruises on her arms and ask what happened. And she said, um, Mr. Solis was throwing me around again. And that time frame that he was talking about, that she was talking about, occurred before December 2006. And that evidence was excluded at trial. The district court said that seems a little too far removed or remote. So if you want that to come in, um, we need to have a full 60, 455 analysis at trial. So that was the order going into trial. Um, and that evidence came in. The second group of evidence is evidence of... Um, and it came in without objection. That's correct. Yeah, so there's, there's a preservation problem with that. But that evidence was supposed to be excluded. Came in without objection. And then the second group of ev evidence is evidence that's essentially the same thing, that bruising, um, that Mr. Solis called, caused bruising on Ms. Crump's arms during the week leading up to the, um, her death. So in December 2006, and that the district court conducted a four, full 6455 analysis on and said it could be admitted. 
no objection. I'm claiming that both of them came in erroneously. So I will, unless your honors um, have further questions, I'll conclude my argument. Um, thank you. Thank you, counsel. May it please the court, the state appears by Stephen Obermeyer. I'll address the same two issues in the same order, unless the court tells me otherwise. Uh, as far as uh, issue three, uh, whether or not a lesser instruction should have been given for unintentional, reckless sort of homicide, uh, the, the state's position is that that's neither legally appropriate nor factually uh, appropriate under the facts of this case. As far as the legally appropriate, uh, the, the legislative change of the statute went into effect in 2011. It was actually passed by the legislature in, in, uh, in the 2010 session. And the, ju the second jury trial in this case was held in January of 2010. So we're basically faulting a trial judge for not predicting that there's going to be a change in the law that's going to change uh, 2152.02 about, um, about lessers and instructing the jury on it for a 2006 crime. And that is why the state's initial argument is that you always look to the law that's in effect at the time of the crime. Unless uh, you're arguing that there should be no lessers for felony murder. Un under the, uh, the lesser statute, that's, that's correct. Um, and if, if the legislature can redefine felony murder to eliminate any uh, uh, lessers, say it doesn't include lessers, why, why isn't their <clears throat> redefinition of reckless to include intentional also uh, of the same ilk to be uh, applied retroactively? Because I think the ilk of the uh, what's a lesser statute is, uh, was deemed procedural in, in whatever case it talks about it, where here we have a, a substantive change in the, in the law as far as what the elements of the crime are and what the penalties of the crime are. Uh, so I think, I think that would be one difference in, uh, in that, at, at least as far as the legal argument and, and uh, the statute, the new criminal code, um, as the court pointed out under KSA 2150103D, states that uh, this uh, code has no application to crimes committed prior to July 1 of 20. 11. So I think legally it would not uh, apply that legislative change uh, and, and nor would it apply factually just because of the, the, the nature of the homicide uh, in this case, which, which was a strangling. And the, the coroner testified that um, it would take between uh, six to ten minutes to uh, strangle someone or, or for, a, for a person with a ligature to, to die. Uh, and here, uh, we have some resistance by the victim uh, who was fighting uh, the assailant. So it would take longer than six to 10 minutes uh, for that to happen. Uh, so under reckless conduct, could, could somebody recklessly engage in a conscious disregard of the risk uh, of, of strangling somebody and a gross deviation from the standard of care to make that a, a reckless uh, homicide and, and just under the facts, I, I don't think you can, can get there that, uh, that it's not factually uh, appropriate. Uh, and I think the uh, killings case is, is supportive as far as you look at the facts of the case just to, to see what happened. And here we have um, the uh, defendant's uh, mother, uh, of, his, of their two-year-old uh, who wakes up on Saturday morning and, and uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't know where his wife is, or um, girlfriend is, ex-girlfriend. Uh, she was basically staying there because she, she lived, that, that apartment was close to where she worked. Uh, he doesn't call her directly to see if she's at work that morning. He's calling her sisters and other people to see if they know where she is. And then lo and behold, he finds her dead in his bedroom 
Uh, and although his DNA uh, is all over her, uh, somebody else must have, have done this. And so factually, it, it is not a, a reckless uh, sort of, of homicide. And, and his fingerprints were on a Christmas card that she had received from a coworker saying that, uh, you, Natasha, you rock. And uh, his fingerprints were all over her cell phone, so he was checking that out. And then his story, as far as where he was that Friday night, uh, did not uh, pan out as far as the uh, cell phone evidence and, uh, and the other evidence. So it, it wasn't factually appropriate. Uh, the last argument on, on that would also involve the, um, the uh, skip rule. The jury was instructed on intentional second degree murder as a lesser of premeditated first degree murder and the jury uh, did not go down to second degree intentional murder. Uh, reckless second degree murder would have been an even lesser uh, degree of a crime. And so under, under the skip rule, the jury would not have even gotten there. Uh, with regard to the, uh, the second, first or second issue as far as the 6455 evidence, there was a, a prior uh, trial in this case in February of 2008. The second trial occurred about 23 months later in January of uh, 2010, and at one of the pretrial conferences before the, the uh, second trial uh, in volume 25, uh, the, the uh, state says we're operating under the assumption that all the rulings in limine and rulings on the motions that were made before the previous trial still applied, um, and uh, the state was going to basically abide by those rulings, and defense counsel acknowledged going with the 6455 and other motions. We understand we are going forward just like we are doing the trial over with the identical rules that we had the last time. And so in both trials, the evidence of the, of the bruising uh, witnessed by the uh, victim's sister and by a co-worker uh, was presented to the, to the jury at, at both trials uh, without objection. But Do there were agree? objections. Excuse me. Do you agree that there was a different ruling as to the earlier bruising observed and that only certain evidence that was closer in time to the crime was supposed to come in? I, I agree that the order uh, did say that the ev that December 2006 bruising was uh, admissible uh, and so that would relate to the sister's testimony. As to the uh, co-worker Richard Kaufman testimony, uh, the question was asked that during the four months leading up to Natasha's death, there were times that she'd come into work and have marks on her arms. Uh, that uh, would apparently be outside of the, the court's order in limine, and I was trying to figure out how that happened, and I would direct the court to the state's motion to admit the evidence of discordant relationship pursuant to 6455 in State versus Gunby. It starts at volume one, page 142. And at page 143, there's a big paragraph where the state makes a proffer of what its evidence is going to be. And it says that uh, Mr. Kaufman saw bruises on Ms. Crump's forearms in December of 2006. Uh, and so I think that's where that came from because in Judge Ruddick's order, and this is at volume one, page uh, 148, the court ruled that the, the evidence specifically described in the state's motion took place in December 2006, and this evidence is admissible. So I, I don't know if that's how it got there, uh, but at any rate, if, if it was an order in limine, it should have been objected to at the first or the second trial to clue in the state that, hey, this, maybe this is outside the court's order in limine, and, and it wasn't. Well, did it come in differently at the second trial? I mean, it, I, I seem to recall that at the first trial there were there were some defense objections. I, I don't recall okay. if that came right. in at the at the with over objection at the first trial. Um, my my recollection it wasn't, but but it, it might have been. Um, but it, certainly it wasn't objected to at the at the second trial, and nor was it instructed in the second trial or the first trial. So we're into whether or not it was clearly erroneous to not uh, give the 6455 instruction. So you concede error? 
I can see, yes, I concede that I concede that uh, uh, State versus Gunby says that uh, that sh it should have been given, and the failure to give it would be reversible if clearly erroneous, uh, and uh, the evidence if. if as to this, the evidence from the sister, I think you had the 6455 analysis, and I think from Judge Reddick's order that the December uh, 2006 evidence, that it would kind of cover both of those. But uh, if you look at State versus Gunby, uh, the victim had been strangled to death uh, and was found in uh, Gunby's, I think the trunk of Gunby's uh, vehicle, and the prior uh, strangling evidence came in under under the analysis. And in this case, uh, you have uh, prior bruising, uh, prior to the uh, strangling in uh, December of 2006. Uh, so that evidence um, would have, have come in. And in addition, if you look at all the other evidence, the relationship evidence that came in that wasn't uh, 6455, uh, that's what would make this not clearly erroneous or would make this harmless error. And I'm talking about uh, the uh, evidence where the owner of the restaurant, the mustache cup, told the defendant, quit coming over here and bothering Natasha. I'm ordering you not to, to come back here. And then he would come back and be across the street uh, or across K7 uh, trying to uh, harass her. And uh, there was an incident where friends were leaving this restaurant and the defendants there uh, to confront Natasha uh, previously. Uh, so there, there was other evidence where uh, that, that came in. In addition, if you uh, look at this, the state's closing argument, the state did not argue that, that uh, Solis was a general wrongdoer who deserved punishment because of these bruises and that he had a propensity to commit crime. In fact, I doubt a juror would say, you know what, I'm not sure if he committed the murder but, but by gosh, she had bruises on her arm, so I'm going to find him guilty because of that. Uh, I, I don't think that is how a, a juror would analyze that uh, evidence on a serious charge like the uh, first-degree murder. Mr. Obermeyer? Yes. Do you mind if I redirect you to go back again to the, um, the issue of this, the statute and its effective date on uh, intentional versus reckless and all of that? Sure. I just, I just want to kind of walk through this in my mind a little with you, um, how I'm thinking about it. You know, both you and, and your opposing counsel brought up the idea of whether it was a procedural or a substantive change. And it seems to me that that matters only when the discussion is about retroactive application of a statute rather than prospective. And it also comes up only when the legislature has not included in the legislation an express statement of its intention about retroactive versus prospective application. Would you agree with me on that? That's when the court moves to a procedural versus substantive analysis, which we have said, I think, more than once in recent days, that is an analysis for the court to make and not for the legislature to pronounce. Are, am I right on that yes, so I far? Okay. Uh, uh, once again, you're right, Justice Breyer. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, it, that it is. A, you That's do the, really the whole reason. <laughs> <laughs> you do the, that analysis when the statute is silent on whether it's right. applies Retroactive. Prospect, retroactive, retroactive or not. Retroactive, really. And, in, I mean, and, and that's because the defendant has a right under the Constitution, an ex post facto right under the federal Constitution, um, not to have the statute retroactively applied if it will disadvantage him, and that's a highly summarized version of ex post facto <clears throat> law, as you know. Correct. Okay, but so when we're in prospective land, uh, and the legislature has made an explicit statement about its intention to be prospective, that in fact just reinforces the presumption that we always engage in, correct? I, I think it does. Okay. Pl plus the fact that if the legislature had said, we're going to make this entire criminal code retroactive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the court would have ex post facto problems with, with that, saying that something that wasn't a crime before sure. July 1 of 2011 is now a crime. Sure. And Obviously, it, some sections would be problematic under ex post facto. Right. And okay, I just wanted to make sure that we were clear and that my earlier question wouldn't be misunderstood because, honestly, pr procedural versus substantive just doesn't matter here, does it? When right. you have an express statement about prospective application, which is our presumption anyway. 
Uh, yes, Thanks. that's correct. I think I've covered all the arguments that I wanted with, to make. With respect to uh, uh, Judge Ruddick did go through uh, the Gumby analysis on part of it that he allowed. Uh, what was the uh, uh, disputed material fact or facts that justified admission? I, I think he ruled that the evidence was admissible uh, to show the uh, relationship of the parties and the defendant's intent and um, and motive. I think were the, were the uh, were the three things that he ruled admissible to show those things. And uh, in, in one of the cases I cited on uh, uh, before. Uh, to show the relationship of the parties, I know I cited a case that talked about uh, prior batteries between spouses uh, is relevant to show uh, identity, motive, and the relationship of the parties. And uh, so he, he, that, that was the uh, nature of the ruling, and I think that was based on case law uh, at, at the time. And it, and it also kind of uh, rebutted the defendant's statement to the police that he just had this rosy relationship with the victim and and even though she was uh, in her working clothes from working for a cleaning business uh, when she was found the next day that, that they uh, uh, had consensual sex uh, the night before so uh, I, I think it would still be relevant even after Gumby for those three things based upon the case law uh, for those reasons the state would ask this court to affirm the defendant's conviction do we have any more questions thank you counsel thank you Reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Uh, I'll just briefly note that the district court admitted um, evidence of the December 2006 abuse for to prove the um, material facts of motive, identity, and discordant nature of their relationship. And that's volume one, page 148. So not intent. I think there was discussion about intent, but identity. Um, yes. You, are you challenging uh, discordant uh, relationship or relationship of the parties uh, as being a uh, material fact that can be proved? We've, we've said that the eight in the statute are illustrative and not exclusive now. I, uh, I'm not challenging that, or I did not in my brief challenge that as... Um, something that the this evidence can be admitted to prove like uh, I did not try and to exclude so why, it as a why why wouldn't it be relevant in this case then I, I don't think that um, it was in dispute that they had a discordant relationship um, you know there's been statements that the defense was trying to um, show this as a rosy relationship that Mr. Solis admitted that they had an argument that escalated to scratching each other um, there was evidence of, you know, arguments um, and him showing up outside her work. So there was there was evidence that there was a discordant relationship. It was not in dispute. So when when defendant admitted that he had hit the victim that night, that made um, their relationship not material or not disputed. I'm, is that what you're arguing? Uh, yes. I, yeah, the, I mean, the argument is that he was not, it wasn't in dispute um, whether they had a discordant relationship. Um, also, I think that in order for the um, evidence of prior instances of domestic battery to show, to have any bearing on... Um, motive or identity, there's some evidence that was missing that would have made it relevant. Um, it would have been relevant if there was testimony that, um, you know, domestic batteries typically lead to repeat instances, incidences of violence or domestic batteries typically lead to strangulation. But we didn't have any kind of testimony. The inference is, well, um, he hit her in the past, so he must have done this. Um, you know, I think we kind of all assume that um, 
domestic battery as something, as a cycle that just um, continues and can escalate to severe violence. But there was no actual extra testimony, there was no evidence that that is in fact the case. And so without that, we're left with propensity evidence. Any further presentation, counsel? No, Your Honor. Do we have any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement. This time the court is in recess for 15 minutes.